This is Steve Wright for the Foundry to talk about using Nuke for stereo conversion. I do a lot of Nuke training and of late most of it's been for stereo conversion. So let's take a look first at some key concepts in stereo. The world we live in is 3D, but we see it in stereo. If you've got your anaglyph glasses, you can see my stereo head here. Stereopsis is the phenomenon that allows the human to see the world in stereo. Our two eyes see objects from two slightly different angles, and that is integrated by the brain to create the stereo view. The interocular distance is very important, and that's about two and a half inches. That's the distance that the eyes are separated. For Europeans, that would be about 67 millimeters. This distance is very critical because if you cheat that too much, either too wide or too narrow, you can defeat the stereo effect. So for human eyes, the interocular distance is about two and a half inches, but when you're talking about stereo cameras, the term switches from interocular to interaxial. The two most critical concepts for stereo vision are convergence and accommodation. Convergence is the inward rotation of the eyes to converge on the target. Accommodation is the focusing of the eyes on the target. In the real world, we converge and focus or accommodate at the same point, converging and focusing on a nearby object or a distant object. However, for stereo films, the convergence can change from near to far, but the focus or accommodation is always on the screen. This causes a disconnect between convergence and accommodation. This is an unnatural act, and about 15% of the audience can't do it. Parallax is what controls the apparent depth of an object relative to the screen. Here on the left, the left eye has been shifted to the left of the right eye, and that's called positive parallax, which puts the object behind the screen in screen space. If the left and right views converge at the same point, that's a zero parallax, and that puts the object right on the screen. Over here, the left view, seen in red, is switched to the right, that's negative parallax, and that pulls the object into theater space. The final result of this is fusion. The brain integrates the left and the right views by correlating features to create the stereo image. If there is no fusion, there is no stereo. Okay. Let's take a look at several methods for doing stereo conversion with Nuke. Nuke is like this wonderful Swiss Army knife. It has all these different tools and capabilities that you can do virtually anything you want. I'm going to show you three completely different methods of stereo conversion using Nuke's tools. The first method is simple displacement. Let me play this clip for you. This anaglyph stereo head has been made simply by doing displacements on an image. There's no meshes, no stereo cameras, no 3D, nothing. So let's take a look at how that works. I'll switch over here to this man head version here, and you can see I have a left and a right view. These left and right views, of course, create the stereopsis, and these were created with a simple displacement map. I can show you right here in the Nuke Roto node. I'll switch to the alpha channel and I'll dial up all the control points. So using a Nuke Roto node, I created this displacement map where the bright parts will pull the face forward. The brighter they are, the farther forward they come. So let's close that and go back to our picture. So that Roto is used as a displacement map here in the distort node. And there's the distortion applied to the left eye. If I switch over to the right eye, here's the map for the right eye. And now we just turn on the anaglyph and we get our stereo head. Notice my cursor, which of course is on the screen plane, looks to be on the same plane as the ears. However, when I move the cursor over the face, we get this very unnatural image because the face is coming forward to the screen, but the cursor is still on the screen plane. So this is a very big difference in our parallax. We can shift the parallax by changing the convergence. I'm going to open this up here. The convergence is simply to shift one of the other views, left or right, and that will change their relative positions in space. There. Now, when I put the cursor on the nose, the nose appears to be right at the screen plane, but now the ears are back in screen space, and this looks unnatural. So we can shift the convergence simply by changing the left and right offset of the two views. Now let's take a look at the displacement method being used for a real shot. So here's our movie. I'll play the clip for you. And again, if you have your anaglyph glasses, you might want to watch it this way. 
And this has a very nice stereo effect, which we're going to create with just displacements only. So we'll stop that and take a look up here at the background displacement map. This is the map that's going to be used to displace the image for the background plane. Where the background displacement map is bright, it'll be pulled towards you, and where it's dark, it'll be pushed back. Now the boy appears in our background plane, but he's going to be overwritten by this boy here. This is the boy's depth map, which will be composited over the background depth map. This was made from rotos, and in Nuke, there have been gradients applied to each part of the roto in order to give the body parts different depth in Z. You can see that right here. If I turn the viewer gamma down, you can see the different uh, gradients applied. I'll reset the viewer gamma. So that version of the boy is going to be composited on top of the background. And now we're going to have this version of the displacement map. Once again, this will go to our plate. Once again, that displacement map will be used to distort the left and right views differently. This is the right view. Here's our left view. Okay. And again, this is simply doing offsets in the pixels. There's no three-dimensional geometry here. The limitation of the displacement method is you cannot have a great disparity front to rear in objects in the scene. Something very close to the camera, something very far. The reason is we're distorting the image. We don't really have separate planes. You can see that here. If I jump to this frame here and we zoom in on the shirt. Look at the front of the shirt right here. When I switch to the right view, you see that stretching? Well, that's because this background here is being pulled to the right and the shirt is not being pulled as far. So the boundary, the border between them gets stretched. To fix this, we're going to have to do some stereo paint. And of course, Nuke has a powerful roto paint node, which we can use to come in and paint out the problem areas. All right, so there's our left view and our right view. So you can use Nuke's roto paint node to do all your stereo paint work. Another thing to keep in mind is because the objects are not on separate layers, let me show you this, the background here is not being revealed, okay? You don't get a displacement between the left and the right views. The background's being pulled to the right, but again, it's stretching the edge pixels, so you're not revealing new background. So the displacement method is limited in how deep the scene can be, and you're going to have to do stereo paint to fix the artifacts. The next method I'd like to show you is what's commonly called the rubber sheet method. With this method, a mesh is going to be displaced in Z and then rephotographed with two cameras. Let me show you that setup here. We'll switch to the 3D view. You can see my two cameras. And here is that mesh. And you see it's being displaced in Z towards the camera. And that's what gives us the two slightly different views. The camera's, of course, being slightly offset. So the mesh is being distorted in order to give a displacement in Z. And then the original frame is texture mapped right on top of it. It looks all weird and funky, but everything lines up perfectly when you get exactly in front of the picture, like the recording cameras do. All of a sudden, everything looks right. So let's take a look at how this is done. We'll switch back to our 2D view and take a look at the background Z map. Again, it's the same map that we use to do the displacement, but now we're going to use it to distort the geometry. I'd like to call your attention to this gradient up here. I've added that gradient here in order to pull that part of the rock forward, because in the original plate, it, it appears to come towards the camera. So let's take a look at that in 3D. I'm going to select my geometry, switch to 3D. Swing over here to show you. And here is that rock wall. Here is that part that bulges right there. All right. Watch what happens when I turn that on and off. You see? It's displacing the geometry. Also, I got all this lovely texture on the rock by using the original image's luminance. Next, let's take a look at the boy. We'll switch back to our 2D view and come over here and take a look at the boy's depth map. And again, it has the depth gradient that we saw before. But this time we're going to use it to displace the geometry. 
Let's take a closer look at these gradients and how it affects the geometry. I'm going to zoom in here and let's select the head. So I'm going to open up my roto node. All right, here's all the splines that make up our boy's roto. And here's the head spline. So I can adjust, for example, the brightness of that with the sliders, and that will move it forward and backward in Z. I also have feather and feather fall off adjustments. So let's see how all of this affects the geometry. I'm going to turn off the feather and the feather roll off of the head. Then we'll switch to the 3D view. And let's come around and take a look at the boy here. Okay, now we're looking at the mesh. So here's the mesh for the boy's head. You can see how flat it is. So once again, I'm going to call up the spline for the head. And watch what happens as I adjust the luminance. I'm able to control its depth in Z. Also, the feather and the feather roll-off allow me to give it some shape. You see how it looks all flat? If we used it that way, the character would look like a cardboard cutout. But watch what happens as I adjust the feather. What happens is the luminance rolls off from the center out towards the edge. The problem is that the roll-off is linear. I don't get a nice rounded shape. Well, that's what the feather fall-off is for. I'll adjust the feather fall-off until I get a nice pleasing rounded shape, just like a real boy's head. We'll close this, revert back to our 2D view, and let me show you all of the different rotos that it takes to create the boy. Okay, all of these rotos need to be made individually because the stereo conversion is different than simply an isolation roto. I don't just need a roto around the whole boy's perimeter. I need a roto for each separate part that's going to be a different distance from the camera. Once again, we put all that together. And here is our depth map with our little animated boy. And it goes into displacing the geometry here so that we get the displaced mesh in Z. And then we have our left and right cameras to re-photograph it and go back to the 2D view so we can see our render. I'll set the viewer gamma back. There's our left view and our right view. So there you have the two slightly different views of the scene by having the mesh extruded in Z based on that displacement map and re-photographed by two different slightly offset cameras. It still suffers from the limitation of not being able to tolerate objects that have a great depth in the scene. So you will have some stereo paint using the rubber sheet method, but it's more tolerant than the displacement method. And again, just like the displacement method, it does not reveal brand new background behind the character because as you saw, the boy is not on a separate plane. So we're not really seeing new background revealed when we switch views. For that, we need to use the next method the layer method. Our third method is to use separate layers. We're actually going to isolate the boy on his own separate layer and render two separate parts of the picture. I can show you what that looks like in 3D right here. We have our two stereo cameras, our extruded mesh, but this time the boy is on a separate layer. Now to do that, of course, I'm going to need a clean plate for the background. So this represents an added task. If we don't have a clean plate, then the boy will be seen on the background layer and on the other layer and we'll see uh, two boys. So we'll make a clean background plate. Switch up here. Switch over to that. Back to our 2D view. So here's our clean background plate. And of course, Nuke can make clean background plates easily and I even retained the contact shadows of the boy's feet. If it didn't do that, then his feet would float on the ground. Okay, let's go back down here and take a look at the background Z map. So this is the depth map that will be used on the background mesh, and it looks just like the depth map we've used in the other methods. Over here is the boy's depth map, and again, it looks the same as we've seen before. The difference is the boy is going to be rendered on his own separate mesh layer. I'll turn off the background layer, switch back to our scene. There you go, even with his own alpha channel. On the 3D side, he looks like this. 
And of course, as we step through the shot, the mesh is going to be animated because of the animated displacement map and the boy retexture map on the mesh each frame. Again, this looks all weird and distorted, but it all works perfectly when you see the scene from the camera's point of view. We'll switch back to our 2D view. We'll turn off the boy and take a look at our background. So here is the rendered 3D background. You can see the right view here and the left view there. And we have our contact shadows rendered right into the background plate. So if we turn them both on, the boy is rendered and then composited right on top of the background. And here's our composite operation. So we now have a left view for the boy and the background and a right view for the boy and the background and the two are now composited together. So we can see the results with this pre-rendered anaglyph movie and it makes a very nice stereo presentation. We'll stop that to take a closer look at the background. I'm going to zoom into the boy, we'll jump to frame one again, zoom into our boy so that we can see as we switch left and right views watch right here in front of the face we actually see the background shifting left and right it actually does reveal new background because the boy is actually on his own separate layer so by using separate layers we get a higher quality stereo conversion but it's more work we have to create that clean plate but we also don't have to do the stereo paint so this is steve wright for the foundry I hope you enjoyed the stereo conversion with Nuke.